Welcome back, everybody. We're at Blue Water Chairs in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, hosted by Joe Schwab from Blue Water Chairs. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having us, Joe. And you all know my co-host, Heather Lee O'Keefe. So Heather, we're gonna do this one just a little bit differently. We're gonna divide and conquer if that's okay with you. Absolutely. All righty, so here's what we're gonna do. Joe and I are gonna walk through the production side. We're gonna learn how the products are made. You're gonna go get familiarized with the finishing side. And when Joe's done over here with me, we're gonna meet you over there. How's that? Sounds good. I'll we'll catch see you guys a little, in a little bit. bit. Okay, thanks. All right, Joe. Yes. So where we start with Teak products is a teak tree, right? <laughs> well, exactly. We don't have any teak trees going in Fort Lauderdale, so where does it start for you guys? Well, for us, we're uh, actually purchasing the teak through different suppliers here in the United States, and uh, they're sourcing it from overseas, of course. That's okay. where it all comes from, Paul. Uh, a few of the things we've got, the reason we use a couple different suppliers is because different shipments come in, different qualities and things like that, and we're looking for a specific furniture quality, just like somebody doing a teak deck or teak covering boards, they're looking for different grain as well. So uh, that's where it is, and yep, it all comes in here. And uh, as you can see, we for different areas of the chair, table, whatever it is, we will be uh, using different thicknesses of wood. As you know, everything with wood is measured by quarters, so you don't right. have an inch and a half, you have six quarter. Right. Just like you have four quarter, five quarter, six quarter, on up to, heck, you know, 12 quarter. Yeah, it's, uh, is it becoming more difficult to source good, straight grain, thick, wide planks of teak, Joe? Well, that's exactly it. All of those terms together, Paul, make it a challenge. Good, thick, straight, straight grain. grain, all of those different things, they, they all contribute to the scarcity of the wood. You can get one piece that might be good coloring, but poor graining or something like that. So it's, it's very important that you get all of those qualities that you just said. And that typically comes from old growth teak as opposed to plantation teak. Correct. which we see in a lot of boats these days. It's that teak that has a little bit greener hue to it, and it's mostly more veneers than it is thick pieces. Yes, yes, they're all veneers that are uh, usually what, what's been known as remanufactured, uh, okay. things like that. Whereas, yes, we're using the old growth trees. Is okay. what, what we're well, let's at. take a look at some of the products that we make starting at the, at the beginning, and we'll work our way through to the end. Absolutely, yeah. What we've got here is this is a shaped up piece, so we've taken our raw planks and we've actually milled them down a little bit. We've taken some templates and some shapes and we've actually taken all of those, cut them Different and glued them into a general shape of what we call our battle station. Okay. This will be our molded seat that we're going to uh, actually put on a five axis machine and machine out the seating area so of it. So you use a router to do that after you've put the basic shape together. Correct. Here. Okay. Correct. We're putting the uh, right. basic shape together here, and then it's all going to turn into a uh, finished molded seat when we're done. And here it speaks to some of the difficulty of sourcing materials to build a product like this. Obviously, you couldn't find a piece of teak <laughs> this thick, but in order to do a build up with as few pieces as possible, you're using six quarter teak here. Of course, of course. As you see there, we've got uh, seven pieces of six quarter put together for just that seat part of it. So okay. yes, that does uh, it does take up quite a bit of teak to do that. The other interesting thing that you wanna do, Paul, is you wanna make sure that when you're laminating together that you're using different graining. What, ha what can happen, you, you see it with any plank where if it's just made out of one solid plank, it'll warp or take shape. So what happens is by using two pieces of wood together, they'll work against each other to control each other so you don't get a warp or shape into it. Kind of the premise of plywood on an expanded view. Exactly. Okay, exactly. all right. So this is the rough shape for what we call a battle station. We'll see a little further on what a battle station starts to take shape as. You've got another piece over here that exemplifies some of the other wonderful things that you guys build. Exactly, exactly. This, Paul, is one of our cockpit tables. Okay. That's a uh, 30 by 48 that we're manufacturing there. Earlier today, that was a, the center section of it was a solid piece of uh, six quarter there. What we did was we milled it down and then we did what's called a resaw where we literally ripped the board lengthwise and fillet it, as you say, like a butterfly fillet. Right. What we call, we, we open it up and do a book match so that here right down the middle, all of our graining and texture is all the same. All the, the lines are all very consistent with it. What's gonna happen there, that center section is actually going to be a quarter inch thick hardwood. The nice thing about using 
uh, quarter inch as opposed to uh, other types of types of manufacturing, that will allow us to get in there. It'll stabilize the piece of wood. And uh, as temperature changes and environment changes, that center section of wood will change along with the hardwood on the exterior, what we call the rail. So, of your, the so your rail, your banded rail, is a full thickness. And then instead of using a thin veneer inside, which would be a less expensive way, using less material, you use a thicker piece inside because it'll expand and contract in the environment in a more similar fashion. So it doesn't want to separate and destroy your finish. You are correct there. Okay. That's, exa that's exactly why we do that. Along with that, uh, what we will also do by using the quarter inch piece in the middle is in a refinish, or if a piece were to get damaged, somebody were to ding it up, you can get in there and make a repair on it. A lot of times the veneer is, is gives a nice finish. However, what can happen is you can't get in to make a repair. Usually the only way to repair a veneer is to apply new veneer. And on the back side here, I see we've got black formica on the back side. Is that just so we don't have a raw finish or is that actually a protection well, as well? It's yes, it's it's two twofold. And like you said, one, it, it definitely cleans up the bottom edge of it, makes it much more presentable. Although nobody very few people will ever see the underside of it. <laughs> Or if they're at that position on the deck, they're not going to remember anything the next morning anyway. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yes, what it does is it seals the back edge as well. Okay. Like you are saying there. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So yeah, by tomorrow, that'll be actually over in our finish shop. They'll edge it, they'll uh, nose it and edge it tonight, and then it'll be ready tomorrow. So speaking of tables, here's a really interesting piece. You guys have uh, a, a product line that you're very well known for. You do a lot of things with great consistency and great repetition. The, 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 the tables, the chairs are beautiful products, but that's also instilled a, a request from a lot of people yes. to you to pro provide other products, right? Yes, yes. So what are we looking at uh, here? This table, uh, we talk about all of these exotic species. Here's a Wenge table, okay. species of wood. Right. And, uh, what, what happens here, this table, a customer that we've had for a bit has requested us to build a cocktail table for them. Okay. And in this case, as you see, we were putting a piece, this will end up being a high polished piece of uh, inlaid stainless. There's LED lights going into it. You can see all the different shapes and design that's put into just this single piece, not only with the graining, but all of your angles. Each, each one of these pieces of wood needed somewhere between nine to 12 different cuts to fit that piece into this jigsaw puzzle. That's what's fascinating to me. I'm, I'm a hobbyist carpenter, Joe. I mean, <laughs> we've known each other a long time. You've seen some of the things that I've built. Oh, yeah. And to see the complexity and the level of precision here is really, really fascinating. I don't know how much of the audience really appreciates the level of complexity and detail and thought that has to go into this before you make the first cut. You know, it's the old measure 17 times and cut once. Our head carpenter will only work on this piece on Saturdays and Sundays when nobody else is in the shop. Okay. Because no distractions. There's no distractions, and when the saw gets set at the certain angle, nobody comes in and touches it. Makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a beautiful piece when it's done, and obviously that's upside down. So we're going to see a few pieces later on that will actually go on the sides before it becomes a finished product ready to go over to the finishing shop. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what do we got here? Oh well, this is. Uh, we saw our early version of our battle station over there, Paul. Well, this does look familiar. So we've got <laughs> our plywood-esque uh, uh, laminates here of the six-quarter teak. Yes, we okay. have all of those put together. We have the rocket launcher put on top. As you can see, this has been machined on our five-axis machine, okay. where it's actually uh, taken its, its shape. And Wh then uh, from there, what happens, it gets its, it gets its finish put on it. And then it comes back over here to get the final uh, bait tackle drawer put on it, bait tray, tackle drawer, all of that's put on. And then the hardware gets installed. And we'll see the finishing process with Heather in a few minutes. Now I got one question for you. Would I be violating the proprietary secret if I asked you, how do we fasten that rocket launcher to this battle station without any visible fasteners? Well, that is, is that, that classified? That is something, uh, what we've, it's taken a few, uh, a few attempts early on, this was about nine, nine, ten years ago, uh, where we were actually going through some different experiments with it, figured out what was going to work with different fasteners, like you said, and it's got to be blind fasteners. Right. Nobody wants to see a bunch of hardware. However, we have it where, where we've, we've designed it where we're able to do it, where it's a clean install and nobody can see any of the hardware that we're using. What a spectacular end result 
to what comes in the door as a raw piece of wood. That's, <laughs> that's truly amazing. But we're going to be amazed even more when we see some of the other products and in their finished state. So mm -hmm. let's, let's take a walk through here because you've got a couple of other pieces in various states of production. This one right here. Yes, this is a uh, this is a rocket launcher, a like I said, like we said earlier. Yep, this would be what we call our straight eight rocket launcher. Okay, it's very common in a two, boat. Two, four, six, eight rocket ho uh, rod, excuse yep. me, rod holders, and then two cup holders, and a place for hooks, leader, sinkers. Yep, with drain holes. We'll put a drawer on the back side of this, the tackle drawer, of course. And this uh, rocket launcher, like this, is most typical in a boat. 45 up to 55, 60 feet. So uh, this right. kind of serves all purposes for that whole size range there. Okay, all stand up tackle. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So what we're are we seeing these more and more in uh, many of the outboard boats. Uh, many of these larger outboard boats are doing a lot of our straight eights and we make a similar version called our curved eight that brings the uh, edges of it in by about seven inches. So instead of 52, it's 45 inches holding eight rods. Today's outboard boats have bigger cockpits than the boats I fished the Bahamas Championship <laughs> on in the 80s. So <laughs> things have changed quite a lot. So interestingly over here, we're back to some raw material, but what I see here looks a whole lot like a footrest if I'm not mistaken. You are correct there. Yeah, this okay. is actually our shaped footrest that we do in our fighting chairs. And what we've done here is we've taken this piece of wood and we've actually laminated two pieces together, like I talked about earlier, where you're working the grain against the grain. Okay. Uh, that's some of what we've done here. And then we machine it again on a five axis to get all of that shape and style to it. From there, we'll then build it out into our finished footrest. I'll, I'll be able to show you one of those in our showroom in a little bit. Well, that's, that's really important in a footrest too, because a lot of people don't realize when you're fishing 130 pound class tackle, and you've got a large fish on a, on a bent butt rod, your rear end is off of the fighting chair seat in a bucket harness, and all the weight is right it's there right on there. that footrest. That's so it. that lamination makes a difference. Not a lot of people realize, but yeah, the, the seat has nothing to do with a fighting chair when I, it's being used. I've stood up on a few footrests over the years. <laughs> so this looks a lot like an armrest to a helm chair, but Tell me about the interior of that. That yes. seems a little different. What we do, this uh, this particular piece, it's actually a, I hate to use the word, it sounds superficial, but it's a facade. Okay. What we do on our center, on our center line helm chair, it's got the flip up armrests on it, similar okay. to an airplane seat. And okay. what we do, we want it to have the beautiful, rich wood finish on it. However, we still, because of the speeds and the, the ruggedness that these outboards are, you know, the, the, the amount of stress that people are putting on these at 70, 80 miles an hour now, Amazing. we need to make sure that they have something firm to hold on to. Okay. So what we actually do is we will fabricate the internal structure is actually a piece of stainless steel. Okay. So we build all, all of your structures out of the stainless steel. This okay. piece will get fit in. It gets sandwiched on. Okay. So yes, that is and a... And it's epoxied and clamped together? Exactly. And then exactly. it gets shaped a little bit more and it goes to upholstery. Exactly. I yep. like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. So it's strong and it's beautiful. Yes, those are two okay. of the key things. These are just some more of the uh, internal mechanisms that, or excuse me, external parts that need to be shaped to cover up some of that internal hardware there. Okay, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we were making some more pieces over here for the base for that cocktail table, that Wenge table that was so beautiful. So Wenge being a difficult wood to obtain, probably <laughs> extremely expensive, the smart yes. play is to butt join? Yes, that's what we're, what we're, and the other reason we're doing that is we wanna make sure that we continue with our graining, everything stays the same. So we're actually matching the pieces of wood and graining together as we're butt joining them as well. Okay. So those are, it's, it, like I said earlier, our head carpenter only does this on weekends where he can concentrate on each and every piece. Well, it also gives you amazing consistency in color and grain, and that's exactly. what provides a piece of art when Exa you're done, yes. not yep. just a piece of furniture. Absolutely. And these are the sides of the base for yes, that table. Yes, exactly. That we saw. That's that's what we're looking at here. Some uh, some of those sides, and uh, yeah, this uh, the tough thing about Wenge is splinters. Yes. This this is a, a, a tough wood, wood to work it? with. Yeah. yeah. As far as splinters in your hands and all that, I don't even like touching it. Well, you know what's interesting, and, and most people that haven't worked a lot with wood 
don't understand the different characteristics of different woods. They'll know oak is really hard and pine is really soft. What they don't realize is that mahogany is very dusty. Teak is very oily. Teak, when you're working with it, you've got to change saw blades all the time and sharpen them. You've Absolutely. got a very oily product. So there are different characteristics to different woods that really give them different flavors, also give them better applications in different environments, like we're using them in the most hostile environment in the world, the saltwater world. And that's, that's why teak is so popular on the exterior, because of the oils in there. It actually has its own preservatives with the teak oil in the, in the wood itself. It's durable and it's less likely to check, crack. So you freehand every cut that you guys make, right? <laughs> uh, we used to, <laughs> okay. we used to. All right. uh, most everything is now cut on uh, CNC routers or five axis. Uh, so we'll do a lot of things that way. Uh, however, as you can see, we still have many of our fixtures all around the shop. Okay. So we, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll get a customer that maybe maybe once a piece, but because of the shape and size of their cockpit or their area, we need to do a custom size. Okay. So we'll pull down some of our fixtures and maybe modify that. Or of course you get the one that, hey, I need this all of a sudden, and we can pull down and still hand cut a piece if we need to. So with things that you produce pretty consistently, you'll subcontract with your materials, you'll do the, the rough shapes, and then you'll have a CNC, an outsourced CNC machine shape them for you and then bring them back in here for your final finishes and assemblies and things of that nature. Correct. But when you saw that certain shapes worked better over the years, you built fixtures yep. that gave you the ability to replicate something over and over and over again exactly. without having to remeasure it. Exactly. Amazing. Yep. Okay. All right. What a beautiful shop, Joe. You guys have got, you know, you know it's amazing. And, and, and when I say beautiful, you know, maybe to the casual observer, uh, you wouldn't say, oh yeah, that's a place that I want to take a date on a Friday night. <laughs> but, but the reality of it is, what- Why do you guys, say that? <laughs> exactly. What you're able to produce here is what I think is beautiful. And I'm one that's always enjoyed working with my hands. I love getting behind the curtain and figuring out how things are made. So it's fascinating to me. You know, I'll admit freely, this isn't my first visit to Blue Water. <laughs> I started doing business with Tommy, the founder of the company. Oh gosh, well Tommy and I got to know each other when he was in high school. We, oh my we, gosh. we won't go any further than that. Oh. But he's done a great job in building a magnificent company. You're, you're doing a phenomenal job in helping the public understand the quality of the products and helping them through the process of owning them. We've learned a bit about the production. Let's break and head over to Heather. I think she's going to teach you a little bit about finishing, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's, I look forward to that. All right, we're going to head over to the finish shop. Sounds like a plan? So this is the finish side. So basically, you've got the shop divided into two specific areas. One where we're bringing the raw materials in, we're producing the products, as you and I were talking about earlier, and then we bring everything over to this side where we finish it. Exactly, yes. Okay. What we're doing over here, we keep the carpentry over there and the finish over here like you had said. Well, I think so, oh, I see, yep, here's I Heather. see Heather and Chris. Looks like Heather's learning a good bit about our build-up coats with epoxy. Heather, you starting to get a feel for what's going on over here? Yes, I'm learning so much. This is a fascinating process. It, it really is incredible. Joe's going to show you through a little bit more of it. I'm going to okay. let these guys get back to work. I'm going to hand you off to Joe. Joe's going to show you through the rest of the finishing process, and I'll see you all back in the showroom okay. where we'll talk about some of the different products. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. I'm leaving Thank you, you in Heather's capable hands. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Chris. So, yeah, what we're doing here is we're hand applying our initial layers of epoxy on here. One of the key things that Brian is doing is his application is all done by hand. A lot of other places, what they'll do is they'll actually spray finishes on, which is a good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. However, it does not work the material into the grain. So part of using the hand brush is you're actually working the material into the grain. So uh, that's, that's one of his steps there. Once he gets done going with the grain, he'll brush against the grain. Again, you're trying to work it into all the nooks and crannies. Once that's done, he'll go back a third time and he'll run it with the grain for the third time. And that's going to then secure that first coat in there. Once that's done, we'll, re we'll sand and rewind and repeat. Meaning we'll go with the second layer, all done by hand, same thing, three different, three different angles on it. 
with the grain, against the grain, with the grain. Let that cure. Let's do it a third time. And if that's not good enough, let's do it a fourth time. Fourth time's the charm here, right? <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> it. Four times. That's what I learned so far. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So I guess the benefit to hand painting it is that it gets in those grooves. And I'm sure that makes it stronger too, right? Exactly, yes. What you're doing is you're working the finish into all the nooks and crannies and grooves, uh, things like that. So it's very beneficial to do it that way. And one layer at a time, what that's going to allow us to do is really inspect the process as we're going through it, inspect the part, and make sure that it's all getting in the right spots. Another way of doing a lot of, th a lot of these parts is what's called high build, which is a good way of doing it. We put the same application on all of our furniture, whether it's, I, I use the word furniture, whether it's a cocktail table going inside a salon or a fighting chair out to do battle with thousand pound Marlin, it's all getting the same exact finish, which is that exterior high gloss, tough as nails finish on the exterior of it. That's incredible. So we're seeing the beginning process here. How about you walk me through the rest of it? Oh yes, yep. So as I said, it's a lot of rewind and repeat. It seems uh, this piece, our battle station, seems to be turning up over and over again. The, actually, earlier, Paul and I were discussing the battle station, how it came through from raw tea to become a shape. And from the shape here, we're actually applying our finish onto it. That's so fantastic. that's what's going there. This is in about, it looks to be its third stage of epoxy on this. Again, hand sanding in between each and every layer of it. And as they're sanding, they're inspecting for blemishes or issues, making sure that the finish is flowing out properly and smoothly. Because if we're no good in the beginning, it's definitely gonna be no good at the end. So we have sure. to start and continue with the correct product the whole way through. Absolutely. As if, we, you, if you get any little piece of dust, it needs to be completely perfect or else that'll come through each layer, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. So what they're doing here, as you can see, there, there are some spots in this. We're still a few steps away from our finished coats on it. But what will happen here is we will uh, go through our some of our final coats, sand in between each one of them, and then go for that final clear coat on it. By doing this slow process, what we're doing is building layer upon layer upon layer. So what it's going to, at the end of it, it's going to give us a deep, rich finish to the material. Uh, we were talking earlier about where you could reach in to touch the piece of wood as if it's, as if it's got a bit of 3D. water on top. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this particular one, again, is uh, one of our customers had requested us to do a custom table for their yacht. And as you can see, we put a mother of pearl inlay into it. Those are all small sections of mother and pearl, mother of pearl that we had to hand lay each piece into that particular uh, section of the of the table. So uh, that's what we've done there again. Like our other tables, Paul and I were talking about earlier. That's a solid center piece with a quarter inch teak, and then our uh, solid rail on the exterior of it as well. Wow. So that's what we're doing there. The craftsmanship is absolutely exquisite. Thank you. Yes, the wonderful thing. The dedication of our employees, the work they do is sure. uh, really second to none. And uh, what I enjoy about being here is that our employees really take vital part in it. Saturday, I was in here doing some paperwork. One of our employees walked in. I asked, are you here to work or what's going on? He said, no, I did some parts yesterday and I just wanted to see how they turn out. Wow. So that's the dedication. I say that we have that really what we're doing is wood and finish that anybody can do, but it's the employees that set us apart from many other people, many other companies in this industry. Absolutely, that's so. incredible. And I mean, it speaks for itself, the work shows, this beautiful, beautiful product. Thank you. So Thank once, you. once it gets the four layers, about how long does it take between each layer? Well, usually, and it all, it depending on weather and environment, and things like that. So really, it's usually a day to a day and a half in between each layer. We got to sand it. So usually we, we calculate about 48 hours. Okay. So you're looking at right there at four layers, that's eight days right there. Uh, so by from start to finish this whole process over here, it can be somewhere uh, three and a half to four and a half weeks. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, very, very detailed process, but I guess it's true. You get what you pay for, is that right? <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. And, it, it, and uh, many customers come in and say, hey, but I need my tables in a week. 
And I said, well, we can't rush this. You know, that's one of the things you don't want to do is rush. Because when you rush, that's where you, that's where you have problems. Absolutely. I've heard of something. If you can choose three, quality, speed, and cost, pick two. You can't get all three. <laughs> what a good point. What a good point. Yep. Now behind us here, these are some tables that uh, many customers that take delivery of their boats, um, especially a lot of the European boats. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is over there, uh, the builders are challenged because of uh, more rigid uh, uh, environmental laws and regulations over there. Uh, and I guess perhaps some of the different materials available, they're unable to get the high quality, high, high a gloss finish that we that we're able to put on here in the states so what a lot of customers will do is take delivery of their yachts with the tables raw send them to us and we'll actually go ahead and put the high gloss finish on them here oh wow and that's one of the things that uh it's taking place here that's very interesting yeah so we'll we'll do a little bit of a little bit of each great and here are some other parts that are uh getting getting uh ready to actually these have been in the spray booth once and they're getting ready to go back in. Okay, so, so th these are almost done? <laughs> almost, yeah, almost. yeah. Don't okay. rush this though, don't <laughs> Not rush yet. this part. okay, okay. This is, the, yeah, you rush it at the end, just like, <laughs> just like baking, right? Right, right. Now, all of uh, our spray booth here is a sealed spray booth. It's all, pr it's uh, pressurized where to keep all the dust out. I've got a team in there spraying right now, so I don't want to go disturbing anything in there, sure. but that's where that last uh, automotive clear coat is step. put on it. And that's that last finish. Uh, these finishes uh, all have UV inhibitors in them to keep the wood looking great over time. And that's all very important in the finish. That's one of the things that this finish is doing is it's protecting the wood underneath from UV and weather. So that's part of what these finishes are doing. Sure. I think we were talking earlier a little bit about the weather here in South Florida. We can wake up and have it be very cold, yes. and then in the afternoon it's 100 degrees. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That that can be that can put a lot of stress. I know that's a strange word when it comes to a piece of wood, but that can put a lot of stress on the piece of wood because yes, it could be 45 degrees at nighttime, and then by 11 o'clock in the morning the sun comes up and beats down on it and it's a, it could be 95 degrees and that surface could be well over 100 because of the uh because of the uv the uv is the thing that breaks everything down so by putting these finishes on what we're doing is we're sealing that from the uv rays breaking down the teak on the on the underneath of it the any or any of the other woods that's wow. where you see a teak deck if you don't maintain it and take care of it it turns gray mm -hmm. because the uv will get in there and bleach it and eat away at it Okay, so it not only looks beautiful, but it protects it too. Exactly. I love it. Well, I'd love to see a finished product. How about we head to, sh to the showroom and meet Paul? That sounds great. All right, let's, let's go. Head this way. I'll follow you. Great. So, Heather, these are some of our parts and pieces waiting for our customers to come in and pick them up. Also, a few of these are some used equipment. You know, every now and then somebody will purchase a piece and say, hey, I, uh, you know, I have a rocket launcher that I don't need now that I have a chair. And they'll end up saying, what are you going to do about it? And we'll be able to trade some of that. That's great. Paul, I learned so much out there. I'm so excited to see the finished product now that I saw the whole process. It is an amazing process, isn't it? It is. So I'm perched in a place that feels kind of like home to me. Um, spent, a few, spent a few hours in one of these over the years. Joe, the, the primary focus of where Blue Water Chairs started was fighting chairs. And while we've talked about a lot of different products that Blue Water has progressed into, we haven't gone to the meat and potatoes of Blue Water chairs, and that's the fighting chair. I'm going to step out of the way, and I'm going to let you explain to the crowd exactly what we're looking at here. Absolutely. This chair here that you're sitting in, Paul, this is our Evolution Series chair. This, you know, that word sums it up. It's our evolution, 33 years of building chairs. Okay. And you know, the, there was trial and error back in the 80s and early 90s. There sure and, was. And uh, here we are now in 2021. And one of the things with this particular chair, uh, it's got no, what we call blind fasteners. You don't see any of the screw heads, any of the fasteners right. throughout the entire chair. Uh, it's a very clean chair, very shapely, very fitted. Uh, this chair would be one that would go in one of the newer boats of, of today. 
There was a manufacturer that I was familiar with that we used to have a big piece of threaded rod and a couple of acorn nuts <laughs> holding on the side arms. Yep. Oh, know? exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So now they've come a long way to uh, custom upholsteries that match different cushions on the boat. Um, you know, we used to have to do this ourselves in the cockpit. If we were bored or we were on a trip traveling to St. Thomas, <laughs> we'd do a little macrame on the arms to protect the, the rod butts. There you go. Well, That's some amazing. of the things that we saw earlier is we've got our shaped uh, footboard here that we talk okay. about. Yep. Uh, yep. So that's what we have going in there. Uh, some of the other things are corner brackets on this evolution chair. We've eliminated those and gone with a a through fitting on our rocket launcher bracket where, you know, it used to be a, a ladder back chair with a ladder back on it. Now we've gone over to the rocket the launcher. The back came out, the chair went on. Yep. I mean, excuse me, the rocket launcher went on and you had a dual purpose setup. Exactly. So fighting chairs, amazing pieces of gear. Mm -hmm. um, we've got big rocket launchers these days. I mean, back in the day, we used to have a four rod holder rocket launcher. This one's five right here in the center, but we'd have four rod holders and a small piece like this. Now we've got guys that are fishing multiple rods. They're fishing 10 rods in the spread, or they want to have five here in the rocket launcher and a couple over in the covering boards. So you've got access to everything. I guess the crew's gotten a lot smarter. We could only handle four rods at the time. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even count that high back in those days. Here's a finished battle station. Exactly. This particular battle station is uh, finished up actually getting ready to go to a customer. As you can see, we're able to put their name in it. Okay. This one's actually getting a table that literally clips to the top of it so that they can fight fish during the day and then in the evening, Load it up with cocktails. Uh, Wine and cheese yeah, and exactly. go for a ride up and down the ditch. Exactly. Without having to remove a chair or a battle station or a rocket launcher, store it someplace, pull the table out, put it in place, it pops right on top. Correct. That's awesome. Correct. That's awesome. And I think helm chairs have come a long way, Joe, as well. Um, there was a time that this was the fanciest helm chair in the business. And in fact, I've got a helm chair like that on an office base in my home office. And it's one of my favorite places to sit. Yeah. I also know of a company that we won't let any names out, but there's a conference room here in town that there are 22 of those chairs around a hell of a conference table. Yep, yep, that's, uh, they, they have a nice operation going on there. They yes. do, so it's not limited to just using the boat. Use your imagination and think of other places that you could put them as well. We just uh, put, put four up on Hillsborough Mile as bar stools. There you go. So, there you, go. Uh, you know, what, what better place to have your memories and create new memories? Well, you know what, they're super comfortable too. But with the evolution of the boats, we were talking a little while ago about the cockpits on these outboards are bigger than the cockpits on the battle wagons that we used to fish offshore on. Tell me about these helm chairs here, Joe. Yes, these are our, what we call our centerline helm chair. And some of the things that we've done here for the new, uh, the, these outboards now that are getting more and more developed compared to when we used to run a 17 Mako around and think that was the uh, latest and greatest. We had uh, a rotocast bucket chair. <laughs> <laughs> We're dating ourselves. Uh, one of the things, this particular chair here, this is our bolstered, what we call our centerline chair. This one we have designed to sit on a pedestal. This one here is designed to sit on the, uh, on the molded base. A few of the things that we've done here, as you can see, we've got the flip up bolster seating on it. So it makes it comfortable for sitting. And then if you want to stand up and run, it gives you wonderful back support. Also earlier, we talked about those arms out there. This right. is the uh, this is the finished arm here, and as we talked about, it's got the, it still has all the stainless steel internal mechanisms in it. Where the ex it's all stainless steel on Delrin. The exterior of it is our finished teak wood that we had seen earlier with our high gloss finish put on it, and then our upholstery gets set right on top of it. So by the time you're said and done, it's a completely finished chair. These are done in, uh, that's done in the new umbrella material. This is done in ultra leather. One of the other interesting things we do, Paul, is our backrests are actually a magnetic backrest. Where are my snaps? That's exactly it. There's no hardware. You just get it close and let it go. How cool is that? Now, that's magic. How do you do that? <laughs> Well, that's, it takes a lot of thought. We actually have to uh, build the magnets into the, into the part. So you embed them in the wood. Correct, correct. Very and, cool. uh, you know, it's, and one of the things we have to take in mind is 
what we used to call the battle wagon doing 22 knots out to the fishing ground. These are going on a boat that could be doing 70 or 80 miles an hour. It's truly amazing. So we need to make sure that those backrests are going to stay on. Because a snapped on backrest would be something you'd be looking for on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully no, it would float. <laughs> Hopefully it would. Hopefully it would. Joe, it's amazing the, the progress, the evolution, if you will, that we've made in chairs, in tables, in helm chairs. But basically what's been fascinating to me is how we're able to take a piece of raw teak wood and produce products of this elegance and this technical superiority. I mean, to look at them, it looks like an old traditional high gloss product, but when you start to peel back the layers, there's a lot of technology in these. Absolutely, yeah. There's between the water jet and machine parts inside and mechanisms, yes. We really appreciate you taking the time with us here. It's been a fascinating tour. Thanks again so much. We're gonna to go to a break and we'll be back in a little bit. Thank you. Yacht Engineering Week 2021 has been made possible by Pantropic Power, the only authorized Caterpillar Power Systems dealer in South Florida. Florida Nautical Surveyors, your complete solution to all of your vessel surveying needs. And Robert Allen Law, exclusively dealing with the business of yachting. We would also like to thank Quantum Stabilizers, AME Solutions, D'Angelo Exhaust, MPI Marine Professionals Incorporated, Concord Marine Electronics, Lauderdale Marine Center, Marine Data, Isotropic, Dockmate, and Murray Ventilation Products. Thank you for joining us this year. We'll see you in 2022.